In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O most holy heart of Jesus, fountain of every blessing, I adore thee, I love thee, and with a lively sorrow for my sins, I offer thee this poor heart of mine. Make me humble, patient, pure, and wholly obedient to thy will. Grant, good Jesus, that I may live in thee and for thee. Protect me in the midst of danger. Comfort me in my afflictions. Give me health of body, assistance in my temporal needs. Thy blessing on all that I do, and the grace of a holy death. Within thy heart I place my every care. In every need, let me come to thee with humble trust, saying, Heart of Jesus, help me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to welcome everyone to our second uh, edition, or edition, I should say, to our Sacred Heart devotional series. And I guess I, I've taken a couple of questions about um, maybe the need for this or why or what the purpose is. And of course, um, devote, we're, we happen to be using uh, the prayers and devotion according to, as it was given to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque uh, in the late uh, 1600s. Um, so it is a particular way of, of understanding the Sacred Heart. Uh, if you're particular to the Sacred Heart devotion, this is the way to understand it. So that was really my impetus to wanting to do this, to uh, help everyone on their first Fridays, because the first Friday devotion uh, can be very difficult to keep. It's not just, the, it is the practical matter of making it to Holy Mass uh, under a state of grace and receiving Holy, Com Holy Communion, uh, in the mind of making reparation uh, for all of the injustices done to the Sacred Heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, you see him there in this image we have, this famous image we have of our Lord. But today I thought, um, one is that last time we left off with uh, in the middle of the first great apparition, and I thought that we would go uh, through that before we really get into the meat of today's um, reflection. And then as well, um, the 12 promises, I mentioned them, several times, and I didn't have them written out. And I guess that kind of reminds me as well to let you know for all of, these, all of those of you who are tuning in now on the first Friday of August or watching this later, but we are a growing, uh, vibrant, uh, faithful community. Uh, but each uh, of the people, each of us where we are in the different places of the world as old Romans, um, we are all responsible for our own selves. You know, we have no central treasury or anything like that. So, you know, you may uh, watch a video from uh, one place that is pretty good as far as quality, and then maybe watch something from mine. It's not the greatest quality, but um, it is pretty good. The problem is, is that um, because we desire to do all of this together through our website, Old Roman, the theoldroman.com, uh, where you can find all of this up-to-date news on everything Catholic and more of our videos and commentaries and daily mass, rosary, holy hour, all of that you can find on oldroman.com. That in order for, I have to make them here in, in uh, Detroit, and then they get sent over to the United Kingdom to uh, the Archbishop where he controls everything for our website. And then he then has to upload and process. And during that, unfortunately, we see sometimes uh, a lack of quality. But it's not because we're not trying. Um, so just to give you that, keep that in mind. And so let's let's quickly go through the twelve promises because those of you who've been who've been tuning in, or maybe you haven't, I got I got a feeling you know something about the Sacred Heart. You know the image about the importance of Fridays, First Fridays, and. That's really what we're expounding on, uh, what I hope to do through the rest of our time today. So um, quickly, I know this isn't the greatest color to use, but it's one of two that I have right now, so bear with me. 
First promise, I will give them all the graces necessary in their state of life. Two, I will establish peace in their home. Three, I will comfort them in all their afflictions. Four, I will be their secure refuge during life and above all in death. Five, I will bestow abundant blessings upon all their undertakings. Six, sinners will find in my heart the source and infinite ocean of mercy. Seven, lukewarm souls shall become fervent. Eight, fervent souls shall quickly mount to high perfection. Nine, I will bless every place in which an image of my exposed heart is honored. 10. I will give to priests the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. 11. Those who promote this devotion shall have their names written upon my heart. 12. I promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who receive Holy Communion on the first Friday of nine consecutive months the grace of final perseverance. They shall not die in any disgrace, and, nor without receiving the sacraments. My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in the last moment. Now, you may be wondering why, wow, you went through those so fast and I can't read the board. Well, that's not the, that wasn't the point. I just wanted to kind of place those on your mind and on your heart uh, as we begin to enter into uh, another reflection on First Friday and Sacred Heart Devotion. And the reason, uh, primary reason I thought it was important to do this is because, you know, remember that it's private revelation. The church does not say that you must believe in this or that. Uh, you have to understand this in order to understand our Lord, to understand grace, to understand uh, the importance of receiving Holy Communion, all those things. What she says is that these certainly are worthy of study uh, and faith. Uh, so you have to study them. Some people, uh, I haven't met many, but I'm sure there are people out there who will say, well, I don't need First Fridays or First Saturdays or Divine Mercy or any of the uh, devotions that the church has approved and that's okay because you don't um, the essentials are found in uh, holy scripture in the sacraments in the holy magisterium of the church when properly operating uh, under divine providence if i should say so you know especially since some of the recent news that we've all been talking about so my point is that the nine first Fridays, that is, which is what we're on right now, is not simply um, making it to Holy Mass on the first Friday and saying a prayer in front of an image of our Lord with his heart exposed. If you can do that, I would never discourage you. But that doesn't mean that you automatically receive these promises. And so... With any devotion, with any meditation, with any prayer, there's always the question of, well, how do I get there? And, you know, how do I judge? Am I peaceful? Am I uh, asking for help? Or do I have abundant blessings? Am I lukewarm? Am I fervent? These are all things I'm grabbing from, from the promises. Um, I'm going to guess probably not, um, which is probably why you're watching something like this, because you desire that. Now, good news is that that is the first uh, thing that you got to have. you got to have desire. A desire for what? A desire to love our Lord more. And so, um, what I'm going to get in today uh, is, um, I want to I go to the uh, first apparition, and then I'm going to, we're going to go into what it takes to, um, sort of like the means necessary to get here, to, to get where you're truly devoted to the Sacred Heart. Um, and it's, it's more than pious devotion, I should say. Um, it's more than just, like I said, completing it, even though um, if, you, if you desire to complete it, there is something to simply doing it. Uh, and I guess this is now as good a time as any. And what, what I'm talking about 
is that uh, I'm taking this, it's, I'm sure all many of the great saints spoke on this, but I'm remembering it from the teachings of Saint Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower. And um, she would talk about, um, you know, our imperfect love for God and that um, while we should be afraid of what could happen to us, that is imperfect. So, but it's good. So that's what I'm trying to explain to you. So, for instance, you may uh, have a great need, dire need, a need that scares you, that is gonna, maybe going to change your life. And so you decide, well, I'm going to do a novena to the Sacred Heart or the Ninth First Fridays, you know, wanting that. Okay, that's wonderful. That's great desire. Um, but if you complete them with any novena, any prayer, any devotion, it doesn't mean that you're going to get what maybe was promised. It doesn't mean you did things wrong. It also doesn't mean you did things right. What you have to understand is that everybody is at a different place in their spiritual life. Only God knows precisely where you are. And so what I was getting to was that some people um, still have great fear, like they're afraid of going to hell. They're afraid of offending God. They're afraid of sin. That's good. That's a good thing. It's called filial fear or, uh, or the fear of the Lord, where it's you're still doing it out of fear. But that, if you keep doing that, if you keep um, expressing that desire, even though it's out of fear, you know, kind of like um, you know, you want to cover your face as you approach our Lord because you feel unworthy. You know, maybe lots of sins that have uh, touched your life. It could be all of that, but you still go. You still approach the mountain. Um, that's good. You know, approaching is always good, and that's what prayer is. And the deeper we get into prayer, it gets, it gets, it changes from not just an approach, but an entering in and a receiving. And I, I think probably everybody that I've ever spoken to that, that has desired guidance on prayer um, this is what they're looking for, except um, it's, you, can, you just can't dive into something like that. You have to have a lot of basics. So I wanted to use this as a basis. And then uh, remember, these are the promises. And then let's quickly go to um, the first. Remember, I, they're explained as the uh, three great apparitions. And uh, these are the, this is the first. This is a, where St. Uh, Margaret Mary, um, remember, uh, in these three great apparitions, uh, the first two, she was in the chapel uh, during her whole spending time before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And then the third time was also before the Blessed Sacrament, but it was just before she was going to receive Holy Communion uh, while Mass was being offered by her spiritual director, St. Claude de la Combier. Um, and so let's go to um, the little chapel in Pere Le Monial. And uh, she says, one day, having a little more leisure and out for occupation, can, our Lord confided to me, scarcely, before what she's saying is that she was, I was praying before the Blessed Sacrament. And she felt confided to by our Lord to go and pray before the Blessed Sacrament. And she says, when I felt myself wholly penetrated with that divine presence, but to such a degree that I lost all thought of myself and of the place where I was, and abandoned myself to this divine spirit, yielding up my heart in the power of his love. He made me repose for a long time upon his sacred breast, where he disclosed to me the marvels of his love and the inexplicable secrets of his sacred heart which so far he had concealed from me. Then it was that, for the first time, he opened to me his divine heart in a manner so real and sensible as to be beyond all doubt, by reason of the effects which this favor produced in me. Fearful as I always am of deceiving myself in anything that I say of what passes in time, it seems to me that this is what took place. And our Lord says to her, 
My divine heart is so inflamed with love for men, and for you in particular, that being unable any longer to contain within itself the flames of its burning charity, it must needs spreads them abroad by your means, and manifest itself to them in order to enrich them with the precious graces of sanctification and salvation necessary to withdraw them from the abyss of perdition. I have chosen you as an abyss of unworthiness and ignorance for the accomplishment of this great design in order that, that everything may be done by me. St. Margaret Mary continues. After this, he asked me for my heart, which I begged him to take. He did so and placed it in his own adorable heart, where he showed it to me as a little atom which was being consumed in this great furnace, and withdrawing it thence as a burning flame in the form of a heart, he restored it to the place where he had taken it from me. Then our Lord says to her, My well beloved, I give you a precious token of my love, having enclosed within your side a little spark of its glowing flames. That is, that it may serve you for a heart and consume you to the last moment of your life. Its ardor will never be exhausted, and you will be able to find some slight relief only by bleeding. Even this remedy I shall so, I shall so mark with my cross, that it will bring you more humiliation and suffering than alleviation. Therefore, I will I will that you ask for it with simplicity, both that you may practice what is ordered, both that you may practice what is ordered you, and also to give you the consolation of shedding your blood on the cross of humiliations, as a proof that the great favor I have done to you is not imagination and that it is the foundation of all those which I intend further to confer upon you. Although I have closed the wound in your side, the pain will always remain. If before you have taken only the name of my slave, I now give you that of my beloved disciple of my sacred heart. And St. Margaret Mary continues. After such a signal favor, which lasted for a long time, during which I knew not whether I was in heaven or on earth. I remained for several days, as it were, on fire and inebriated with divine love, and so completely out of myself that I had to do myself violence in order to utter a single word. The effort I had to make in order to join in recreation or to take food was so great that it was all I could do to overcome myself, which was a cause of considerable humiliation to me. I was not able to sleep because of the pain of the wound, which is so precious to me. It produces such heat within me that it burns and, and consumes me alive. I also felt such a plenitude of God that I could not explain myself to my superiors so I should have wished, regardless of any suffering and confusion which the recital of these favors might cause me. I would rather have accused myself of my sins before the whole world than speak of these graces on account of my extreme unworthiness. It would have been a great consolation to me had I been permitted to read aloud my general confession in the refectory in order thereby to make known the depth of corruption which is in me, so that none of the favors I received might be attributed to me." So that's the first apparition and St. Margaret Mary's uh, personal thought on it. And, um, you may be saying like me, wow, I mean, what the heck is going on there? Because I think sometimes um, when we hear of these apparitions, you know, special favors, 
that um, the person who receives them must receive them in this great joy, and sometimes that's just not true. And for St. Margaret Mary, it wasn't that it was some great love, great joy. It was that she realized the depths of what it meant. It so struck her that, um, I'm thinking of, a, a, you know, it, the depths of her heart, of her, uh, we could say of her bowels, were completely touched by the burning desire of his love for mankind, which was expressed through it to her. And she felt it in herself. And so she always had the pain. It always bothered her. I read further that First Fridays were always very difficult for her as far as pain goes. Uh, but, you know, St. Margaret Mary um, suffered, like all the great saints, suffered it um, with, with honor and love for our Lord. Now, with all of that said, uh, with the next part is that we're going back to, because now, you know, we've heard the prom, we've heard the, um, beautiful recitation of the uh, of the beautiful apparition, the first apparition to St. Margaret Mary, what our Lord told her, what our Lord promised her, what he asked for, uh, in a sense, because remember, he hasn't asked for the first Fridays yet. I believe that's the second apparition. Um, but, you know, we know that these are the promises. Okay. So, like I was saying, but how do you get there? Because it's not, remember, nothing we do is magic, like some people think. You know, it's not magic to go to confession. It's not magic to take a sacramental and use it. It's not magic to bless yourself with holy water. None of that is magic. It's faith. And remember that in the Gospels, whenever our Lord healed somebody and they would come back to thank him, he always would tell them, it was your faith that healed you. And so uh, even in the uh, some of the most solemn prayers of the church, like the, the prayers for exorcism, even the prayers um, of deliverance, because that's the proper, uh, it's, it's a term that's been hijacked by modernism, but the, the proper prayers of deliverance done for someone suffering from some sort of oppression and the solemn prayers of exorcism, which are rarely used, but those can only have efficacy dependent on the reception of the person. So if the person does not believe, does not have faith, they're not going to work. Uh, it could be the holiest person, the holiest priest in the world administering these things, and it wouldn't do anything. And so sometimes that's recognized. Sometimes, uh, and, and we don't do it. And sometimes it's not understood. Well, why won't you help me? It's not that I want to help you. I want to help you. You're the one that won't help yourself. By what? More than likely, it's about pride. Um, because the person in question is unable to uh, uh, receive the faith that is required, which means letting go of everything, surrendering. I've mentioned that to you before. And so this too is going to be all of this, which is everything here he promises. You can have it. It's yours. Just like in all the other devotions. They, they're there. They're yours. Okay, they're there for you now. You know, I can say this. Everything here is for anybody. Anybody that desires to be close to God. You don't have to do it through the Sacred Heart devotions. What our Lord is saying to us is that here I give you something. That if you do it, then I, I, I promise you, you'll do this. Okay, so let's go back. To, remember, because I you give me a moment while I turn the board. Because remember, um, the promises don't come simply by executing what our Lord has asked us to do. So we have, as long as you remember that, then you know there's probably some work involved with, and there is, as always. There's always going to be work involved with uh, whenever, whenever it comes to our spiritual life. And at least in the beginning, there's only four rules. Uh, I also have up here, uh, you know, we talked about last time, uh, blood and water, the, the, um, the blood and water from our Lord's heart, uh, emanating from our Lord's heart, from the wound, from the wound in his heart, and that it it's, uh, signifies penance and Eucharist, and that this whole devotion is completely wrapped up in the most blessed sacrament, the Holy Eucharist. But those four things um, that must be there in order to practice, to properly practice this devotion through faith, Okay, a great horror for sin, a 
a lively faith, a great desire to love our Lord Jesus Christ, and interior recollection. I would bet there's, there's more than one of you saying, huh, not too bad, I can do that. Okay, um, I will admit that these expressions are um, 17th century expressions. Remember last time I mentioned that, um, that uh, booklet, as it's called, on devotion to the Sacred Heart of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, written by uh, the spiritual director uh, to St. Margaret Mary, Father Croset, uh, after and published after she died. It's never been um, uh, edited. Uh, there's been no need for editing since it was published. Well, that little booklet is almost 300 pages long. Okay, so, uh, and it is written, the, uh, the, tra the translation is um, more of an 18th century English translation. I think maybe there was one more done with a, a little bit better translation, but this is the way it's translated. So as I was looking at it, I thought, you know, even though we don't like to touch uh, these things that have worked over the centuries, um, sometimes if I read that to you with our understanding today, it may not mean precisely the same or it doesn't express precisely um, what is necessary for you to have the proper understanding. So, a great horror for sin. I, I just don't know if horror in today's world um, works, not because it's not a good word, but because again, modern modernity has taken these words and um, uh, I want to say uh, comicalized, that's the it may not even be a word, but I think you know what I mean. It's, you know, horror. They made they they take it. They made it like a horror horror show, horror picture. Horror. That's what at least that's I think that the it's not. Um, it doesn't have the uh, same preciseness that it had back then. So I wanted to explain that some more. A lively faith. Someone may think, well, I'm faithful, but that's not really. I mean, yeah, a lively faith. Actually, there's there's something to that. Great desire for our Lord, a great desire to love our Lord. I, I bet you I, I haven't met anybody who doesn't want to love our Lord. Okay. However, when we start getting into it, um, you may find that there are things that you choose which um, signify that the choice itself is choosing God for, or choosing that first over God. So it might be that you do have other things that you choose first before God. And so this could not be true because the great desire is not there. This would mean that this is first. First. Everything, again, we're back to that word surrender. Everything has to be surrendered. And of course, depending on your state in life, there's, there's um, ways of understanding that. Meaning that if you're married, of course you wouldn't surrender your wife or your husband, although you might want to. Um, children, same thing. Uh, but We'll get into those uh, as, as much as we can in the time we have today. Um, and then interior recollection. You know, especially talking to a lot of young men who believe they have vocations or um, uh, giving guidance to um, everyday as pious Catholics, you know, uh, daily communicants. Everyone says they have interior recollection. And whenever I challenge them on that, within a few minutes, um, they realize it's not exactly what they thought it was because um, it's hard. It's, it's not an easy thing to acquire because, you know, none of these things can really be acquired. That's the problem I have with some of the modern uh, how-to books, you know, how to give your own retreat to yourself, how to console the heart of our Lord, how to um, know which is... And sure, I mean, they're, they're typically well-written, they're well-received because they're, they sell millions of books, but they don't, I don't believe that they go into the steps necessary for you to understand these things. And like I said, we look at them and go, yeah, I think that's me. But when people wonder, well, why, are, why is my life like this? Or why am I having trouble with this? Or, well, we can usually go back to um, a probably a, just a misunderstanding of 
what life is for you in your state of life, what, it, what God brings to you, gives to you, there is there for you to receive, and then those things which are necessary for you to uh, participate in in order to reap the benefits of those things God desires for you to see each and every moment, each and every day. I know that's a mouthful. And again, right at the end of that mouthful, I want to say again, all of that, all the graces, the wonderful graces of heaven, everything is available to each and every one of you at each and every day. It's whether you have the faith to recognize it's there and to receive that it's there. Um, all you need is, like I said, you need the, the sacraments, uh, the, the magisterium, catechism, Holy Scripture. Those are the things that we, we live on, we breathe, and we should breathe on. But most don't have it. So let's, let's go to the first one because we're already, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't want these videos to be long, but they end up being long, mostly because of me, because I can't seem to control my, um, how much comes out of my mouth. That's all right. We'll keep going. And so... A great horror for sin. Um, what would that mean? Well, I think that if I uh, were to ask you, um, what is a great horror for sin? Uh, a typical response uh, will probably be not to break the Ten Commandments. That's true. That's true. That's it. That's a pretty easy answer. Um, what else? What else would be something you want to avoid? Well, I want to avoid gossip, lying. Uh, I want to avoid uh, anger, rage. I want to avoid overeating, uh, smoking too much, or maybe smoking at all. I want to, you know, okay, you, you get my point, is that dependent on who you are as a person, even as a man or a woman, or, Andy, or child or adult, um, and your state in life, married, a religious priest. Uh, I don't, I happen to be one of those, I don't believe in a call to the single life. Um, there must be a rule in your life. So the caveat for me is that if someone just finds themselves single, they should be a member of community. But there are many, like the Dominicans, the Carmelites that have um, third orders, tertiaries, things like that. Where you live your life, you live in the world, but you're, that's okay, but you're not single. You're living a rule. Unfortunately, there are many people who feel like they could be single and make their own rules, their own rule of life. And that's something that we lost. Uh, this is, uh, I'm speaking pre-Vatican II catechism, uh, which is something everyone knew at the time. But so, so the horror for sin is just going to depend. Even, um, I, would, I would go further with this because um, if I'm teaching uh, sacramental prep, so these are uh, six-year-olds, um, and we're talking, it, it gets a little bit easier because you can. You can go very simple with a child, and the child understands simply and receives simply most of the time. However, in today's world, again, I'm back to this world, horror, horror is not going to, may mean, well, let me just say, the, the child may not be afraid because They've been watching horror films since they can remember. Meaning that their parents allow them to watch things they shouldn't be watching. Or they watch TV shows that have horror, horror or horrible things in them. They hear the news that has horrible things in them. And so, when if you express it this way, a great horror for sin, like I was using that word, it's, it kind of, uh, doesn't really mean anything to them. Or probably to most adults, because most adults, even those who have a desire to love our Lord more, horror, what are they, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of these um, uh, video games, because some of them can be quite horrifying. Some, and not just to scare, I mean, the things they do, the things they have you do, uh, in order to advance, and well, they're just games, they're just simulations, okay, but they're horrifying. Is it sinful? Well, I'm not going to get into that because I, I not necessarily. Um, but my my point is is that dependent on who you are is going to depend on what you find horrible. Okay, so children uh, who are homeschooled 
and are controlled by the family and the family unit, um, typically are horrified at the slightest things until they start growing up and they're allowed to watch more, read more, go more. And it's true, I saw an article recently um, about homeschool children who, um, that once they leave the nest, they get into trouble. I, I can tell you that's true. It's almost always true. However, and it's the world, it's the call of the world, that's all. The thing with homeschool kids, that as opposed to kids who do not have that type of support and education from the home. Um, when a homeschool kid goes off the rails, he's got a way to come back. And I've seen it many, many times already. Sure, I mean, they go and do all kinds, you, you name it, I've seen it, I've heard it. But they feel that, they feel compelled. They know, oh, I gotta make it right, I gotta do right, I gotta start living better. Start, gotta, gotta go start going to mass again, you know. And then they do it, and usually, typically, they get married, and they settle down. But the kid who didn't have that as a basis, oh my God, it's so difficult to get that person back in because they never had it in the first place. So you see the difference in horror, of understanding horror. And so you can't just throw these out, of, well, these are the means to get you to um, the point where you're truly living out the devotion and the prayers to the Sacred Heart of our Lord on the first Friday. So, um, I think you get my meaning with horror for sin. Uh, I'm just looking at one of my notes, excuse me, with my cheaters. Um, I guess, you know, um, the word tenderness comes. That's what this devotion, there's a tenderness to this devotion because our Lord is exposing his heart, that which probably brought him, the, as, a, as, a, as a, in his humanity, brought him the most pain, because the pain that we did to him, you know, we centralize our feelings in the heart. Uh, and even though we know scientifically it's not necessarily true, but it, from a spiritual perspective, we do look at it that way. And so his heart, because remember he says, you know, look at this heart which has uh, suffered for, uh, and beats for mankind, loves mankind, would give everything for every person, but receives no love in return. But to you, sister, I give it to you because you will return my love. Okay, that's what this great horror for sin is. That that's what you have to understand. Now, I'm not standing here telling you that I have, that I understand what a great horror for sin is, but the work that goes into it, the daily work, the perseverance in prayer, in your, in your study, in your state in life, you'll get there. You may not understand it now, you may not have that now, but that's part of the devotion, is you practice the devotion, meaning that you make it to Holy Mass. And remember, like other devotions, our Lord simply says you must receive in a state of grace. So if you're not in mortal sin, um, you don't have to go to Holy Confession. You can, it's always good, but you can go ahead and receive uh, that day. Always remember that, the same way with Divine Mercy. Um, you must be in a state of grace, okay? But as you do that, as you receive, as you go and you make that intention, you should be making that intention constantly on, on today, uh, all day long, um, you know, in the sense of throwing up these beautiful short prayers to our Lord. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on me. Um, oh Lord, you know, today's First Friday, Sacred Heart, I'm so happy to, to spend a few more moments extra with you today to think about your adorable heart, what you did for us, um, and even the phenomenon that it still bleeds. It still bleeds. He tells her that in the, in the apparition. So, you know, there's, just meditating on that, you, it will grow this great love for him because remember our Lord tells, him what, tells us from Holy Scripture, Whatever we give, we get back a hundredfold. Okay, so think of your little, uh, the little, the littleness that I can give in, the, you know, during the day on First Friday, the little prayers and all of that. Okay, he throws back a hundredfold. So whatever, just the trying, just the even, you know, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but even if you couldn't make it to mass, but you'd have the desire, 
you know there can be more grace in that desire because you couldn't make it than if you would have made it on your own? It's, it's, a, it's a great mystery. It's something we'll talk about later, but there is that. It's, and that's where everything begins, that desire. And maybe to make it a little bit more familiar to you, if you've ever uh, been in love before you were married, or I'm sure you're, if you're married, you're still in love, but you know what I mean. But you know, think of that, okay, that your, the object of your love was always desirable, is always desirable. It's almost like your interior eye is always wherever your love is. You, you know, you know where she, you know. Like my wife, I, I'm not married. You know, you know, I know where she is. I'd be following her around, even if I was at work. Oh yeah, I know she's here. I know she's there. You know, that's what love is. It's, it's part of love. Is that desire? Okay. In the same way, in the spiritual life, when you receive, because we have to develop, meaning the prayer, the exercise has to be our prayer and our willingness and our desire. Okay. When, when, when God gives us back a hundredfold and we are able to receive that, our desire just blossoms. And the more that we keep doing it, the more it's going to blossom until one day it's going to blossom to our entrance into heaven. I'm telling you, that's how it works. Now, it's not a guarantee, but there is no other thing I'd want to be working on at the moment of my death than to love our Lord Okay, number two, a lively faith. Um, one of the men used to make fun uh, of us because when we say the rosary together every day, on, uh, when we say the, the uh, uh, glorious mysteries, and the first one is the resurrection of our Lord. And the, our uh, sort of intention uh, was always, uh, we pray for a lively faith. And so, you know, lively, lively faith in this said in this way, all, that's something that Saint Stanislaus also used, lively faith. Okay, so I always use that, you know, for lively faith, uh, first first mystery of the Rosary, and then he would chuckle because resurrection, lively faith. I mean, it, gives, it tells you the. It was kind of funny, but not that funny. But every time I said the Rosary, now we we had to listen to that. You know, he chuckled a little bit. But lively faith. What does that mean? Well, you know, it, it, to a, maybe to put a point on it, it means precisely what it says. That your faith is alive, not stagnant, oh, God willing, not dead. But that your faith is alive. And how do you know something's alive? It moves. And depending on how expressive it is, it's going to move in a certain way. Now, I'm not saying, um, you know, I'm not praising worship guys, certainly not at Holy Mass. Uh, but there are people who love that stuff. And as long as they're doing it in its proper context, uh, in a gymnasium or something with their friends, I, I don't care. Um, don't force it on me. Uh, I, but if it helps you, that's how it's a lively faith, maybe. Um, someone's lively faith may be constancy in prayer. You may not see it in them, but you always see them. You know, um, it's, you know, kind of, Again, but my point, it continues to be that a lively faith is not something you just say, oh yeah, I'm, I, have, I love Jesus. I have a lively faith. I'm alive. I'm alive in the Lord. Well, maybe, maybe, but um, that's not what a lively faith is. I, I would say, I mean, so, I, I can't, I'm not saying that someone who's saying that might not have a lively faith. What I'm saying is typically most people don't understand what is a lively faith. You know, what is it that that um, we are doing. I'm not going to the old word that I was looking at. Uh, it's a 17th century word, but anyway, it's English. Not that, uh, but it means that you're uh, a lively faith in the spiritual life. Uh, means that you're constantly paying close attention to what you are doing. Okay, so. Um, that means that uh, if you're saying the rosary, that you're paying close attention to what you're doing. Maybe even um, uh, meditating upon uh, one of the mysteries. So, and, you know, I remember we can't judge, but if someone, if the rosary at 
Holy Mass, or before Holy Mass or after Holy Mass, is going like this. Hail Mary, Bill Gross, Lord is with thee, blessed art thou amongst women, blessed for government. Okay, it may be a little fast. Uh, there was one parish I was at, and uh, uh, we say we say the Holy Rosary after every Mass, and the pastor had been there for 30 years, you know, so this happens. Uh, saintly man, but um, before the response could even be finished, he was already on the third word of the next uh, of the next one. You know, it's really kind of funny. So, and then uh, the Dominicans. Oh my goodness! If you ever are able to attend the Rosary with the Dominicans, and I, I can't speak for all of them. I these are only the ones in D.C. Uh, that I used to where I was going to school, but um, they would do. A rosary. Now, now remember, the Dominicans do the entire rosary every day, but they would do five decades in 12 minutes. <laughs> you know, you'd go before lunch because that's when they would do it. They'd all gather uh, at the school and, they, you know, you could uh, attend in choir and uh, before lunch. And boy, whoosh, they'd go through the rosary. When I was with the Marians, uh, there was an, one of my novice brothers uh, had been researching and found out that there was a saintly nun who said that there should be a pause before you pronounce the name of our Lord. I thought, oh, a nice pious thought. You know, novices are zealous and excited to be there. And so when the daily rosary was said at this particular house, uh, believe it or not, in the Marian houses, uh, recitation of the rosary together is optional, which I always had a problem with. I always thought it's better for us to be together. So. When that time came for each day, because at the same time, usually only the novices showed up, because for us, it was mandatory. So, since it was just us, we just kind of did it at our own pace. Oh my gosh. Because, you know, every now and again, the superior or someone else from the house would come in for a decade. Every now and again. I mean, maybe twice during the whole year of novitiate. But they did not. Oh, it's too slow. It's too slow. You know, I, I don't know. It's too slow. It's too fast. But it's paying it close attention to what you're doing. So there is a balance that has to be there, but it's a delicate balance. So same thing. Some, someone might say, well, you know, when I, when I, uh, I can't pay close attention because I'm constantly distracted in prayer. You know, I go in there and I want to be there and I have a desire of love for our Lord. I want to grow in love for our Lord, but um, I'm always distracted. Okay. So, well, this is what I would recommend. Take spiritual reading with you. In fact, let me recommend, you know, typically to who I'm talking to, it depends on what I think they want, what I think they might get some help from. So, um, spiritual reading is meant not to, is not uh, simply uh, the major distraction, but at least it's kind of holy, so, no. It's meant, again, to give you practice to draw your heart and your mind towards God, specifically towards the Sacred Heart and Reparation, for all the injustices done to the Sacred Heart. Okay, so you have your book or whatever, and you're reading um, holy things, slow, deliberate. And you'll find that in time you'll stop on something that touches your heart, touches your mind, you need some ex explanation on. You may not get too far, but in that, you may in the beginning actually be reading a few pages at a time. Don't get frustrated. Just keep doing that with the intent of not going in there to read, but going in there to receive that which our Lord desires for you. Okay, but the reading can help you in predisposing yourself to that sort of receptivity. It's not easy. Um, it's not as easy as just going in there and saying, I'm here, even though that's the first step. So a lively faith is that being active and studious and uh, in what you're doing, prayer, Holy Mass, confession, anything that you're doing. It could be during the day, you're at work. Um, you could use St. Uh, Saint, uh, John Marie Vianney, would use the top of the hour, uh, because he'd hear the bell, uh, to remind him to give everything to our Lord, to pray for uh, those who ask for his prayers. To pray. You know, that was a reminder for him, so constantly throughout the day. So you can choose times like that to remind you and in that, of course, God is going to reward you, remember, hundredfold. And so you give that little bit. And remember, don't be, don't get frustrated that you only have a little to give. Remember the, the um, uh, woman with the, two pen, with the two pence that she gave in, in the offertory? 
and, and everyone was shocked, oh, she gave nothing, or look at that, it's how horrifying, she should have hidden it or not given anything. And you know, you know the story, our Lord says she gave more than anybody else. Same thing with us. You may, you may not know it, but you may be so poor, spiritually poor, in the sense that you have nothing, you don't know how to pray properly, you don't know how to receive properly, you're not receiving the sacraments properly, maybe not even being a very good Catholic, let's say. Well, you, that's what you take to our Lord in his sacred heart. You take that to him. So why? why? And he'll look at you. Hey, why are you bringing this to me? And you're supposed to answer him. Because I want to love you more. And I need your help to do that. And he'll smile and he'll say, okay. It's yours. And you go, I don't feel anything. Work and pray. You'll get there. Lively faith. And I think, you know, the third one, the great desire to love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's not just this fluffy love that you hear uh, maybe from the pulpits of some of the parishes you might attend. It's not that. Because a great desire to love our Lord is a great desire to compassionate with him and compassionating with him because that's what happens is that you see him for all that he is the crucified one for all that was done to him and properly compassionating with someone it's not just to look and go oh man why'd they do that to him you know he didn't do anything innocence innocence and yet look how quiet he was he just took it okay i mean that's a start but to compassionate is to take, is the desire to take all the pain and sufferings of that person on to yourself. Not to ask for it, to desire that, that you so love that person that you would take everything of them onto yourself in order to bring them peace. And, you know, we look at our, if you only, if you could see our Lord with what He is. And we start with, um, you can't see the whole thing, but you start with the crucifix. That's who He is. And that's how He is in every moment of every day. And when you begin to understand what He is, how He is, who He is, in all his wounds, in the fullness of his crucifixion, that's what should move you in, in the greatest of love. And the, to compassionate, you want it from him. Okay, most of us don't feel that way. We love him, but we don't feel that we're just, you know, it's there for us to have. But it's something that you have to work on in order to receive, okay? And so how do I know? You can say, well, how do you know uh, whether anybody has received that? It's not that I know. It's people who understand properly this great desire to love our Lord. You see it in them. They don't have to say anything. It's easier to see or maybe to assume in priests and religious, but don't. Um, but I guarantee you, those who truly have this, a great desire to love our Lord, they don't have to say anything. It shows in everything that they do. And I want to make sure that, oh, because um, uh, most of us in this you know, sort of the, the saying that we have this desire to love our Lord, most of us, um, it's a very superficial desire. Now, again, and going back to where each one of us are, are um, from a spiritual perspective, it may be a superficial desire, but it may be all you have. You don't, re you don't know it's a superficial desire. But hopefully you have a priest or religious that can help you in charity, uh, in great charity, understand that it is a superficial desire. Uh, but it's what you have. 
Um, there's an understanding, you know, we are mendicants, beggars. Um, and a mendicant uh, receives with great joy because maybe he was hungry or he was thirsty or he needed something and he had nothing. So a mendicant will receive the crumbs from the table with great joy, hopefully. Not, well, what's in here? Is it ham or peanut butter? Because I'm tired of peanut butter and ham is okay, but does it have mayonnaise? I don't like mayonnaise. You know, it's, you take what you're given. This is, you know, what do we learn this from St. Paul. You know, sometimes he had everything, sometimes he had nothing. Sometimes he was beaten to death, near death, stoned to death, hanged. Sometimes he was treated well. And as a mendicant, you are at the, sort of at the mercy of the people of God. And thanks be to God, there are still wonderful, wonderful people out there who are generous and who are willing to, to continue to support God's poor religious. But what do they see? Because they don't, I mean, they may know me from a video. They may know me from uh, a chance meeting. Maybe they knew me from one of the parishes I've been at, or maybe they've known me for spiritual direction, whatever. They somehow, they see that I have a great desire to love our Lord, and I do. I don't go around telling people, but I kind of do in everything that I do. And like I said, when someone has that, you'll see it. But all of us have to be very, very careful with that pearl of great price. And when we begin to understand, because you know, if you're with me so far, and you're here, interior recollections probably were, it's going to get everybody. And I did a series, I think it's available on the Old Roman now. If it's not, if it's not I'll make sure it's there. I did a, a series on Cardinal Sarah's book on si the power of silence. And I was very, uh, that book I thought was excellent. And the series I did following the book and, and the reflections I gave on the book uh, were well received and I think they're well worth watching. Uh, it's, a, it's a dense book, a difficult book to get through, but I think if you, if you uh, in fact, if you want a copy, I'll be, I have several, I'll be glad to send you one. Um, uh, to follow along with, with, the, with the video conferences uh, would be a great help in understanding what interior recollection is because it's not just being quiet. You know, how many of us, again, you know, how many of us go into Holy Mass or go into a chapel um, and we sit down and there's constant things going on in here or in here or, you know, or even in our prayer, we're unable to be quiet, you know, um, just to simply sit and receive what our Lord desires to give us. And that's not always easy because we do want things. I mean, uh, some of you have heard me say, you know, that we have to be careful how we enter into prayer and not enter into prayer with saying, hey, Lord, I'm here. Listen to me because I got, I got some things to tell you and I got some things to ask for rather than entering into prayer by saying, hey, Lord, I'm here. What is it that you ask of me? Because there's a big difference. And you can begin just by doing it. You may not understand it, but just by doing it, the more and more you do that, um, the more and more expressive your desire will be that your great love for our Lord faith becoming alive like that and you will because you'll be living that you ingest your life you will begin to see things that will suddenly horrify you for instance it could be um, foul language maybe you used it or you may partially use it at times and now it just it might horrify you well that that's because um, there's an interior uh, purification going on but it may not happen right away. It could be all kinds of things. It can be a show you once liked that no longer is giving you the satisfaction it once was. It can be all these things. But the point is, is that we're trying to get to this interior recollection. And I'm glad it was number four because that's the most difficult. It's not easy to have that. Um, I hope that as a monk, as a religious, that we do have that. Um, I have that. But I can tell you, I didn't know exactly when I finally had it, or how long I had it. I just know that I, I, I have it now, and I can say to you that for me, it was very, very difficult. Years of 
constancy in prayer, in desire, in perseverance, and really not really even knowing what was coming. And in many ways, not understanding what interior recollection was until I received it. And so now uh, someone with proper interior recollection can really be anywhere and be in the presence of God. Um, the, the noisier, louder, more offensive the place is, maybe the more difficult. It's not easy. There's a wonderful uh, painting I, I love of uh, St. Anthony of the Desert, the great desert father. And uh, it's just a picture of him sitting sort of like outside or on a little stool. And he's sitting there and around him are painted all these little demonic figures. And a couple have his beard out like that, pulling at his beard. They're poking in his eye. They're sticking him in the side. They're, and his face is, I guess, serene. Um, there's not, you know, it's not a sense of happiness on his face. It's just serene. And I've always liked that because that is what life is. That is, you know, there's always going to be something. And interior recollection will help us get through those things. Because our heart, our mind's eye, Remember that we're talking about love, the great desire, great love for our Lord. Our mind's eye is easily turned towards our Lord. That's where we are all the time before our Lord. And so it, make, it can make life very, very difficult in the sense that because you begin to become horrified by your own behavior sometimes. Because you're thinking, oh my gosh, I do this. Or you recognize it's something you begin to recognize that you didn't before. So that's why sometimes when people are really working on their spiritual life, especially in understanding uh, and practice uh, the first Friday practice and devotion, they do, they start to change when these things are present. But I'm going to venture to say that most people who practice first Fridays do it poorly. That doesn't mean they won't receive something, of course, because again, what? God gives us back a hundredfold. So I'm not judging them. I'm saying, at least you're doing it. At least you're trying. And yeah, it might be poor, but you can do better. I want to challenge you. I want, and that's what these videos do. They challenge you. and they should. You should go away saying, wow, I don't know if I can do that. Yes, you can. It's not easy, but it will come easy because of the desire that's there. That's what you have to remember that you have to enter into your prayer and to this devotion like a beggar, that you have nothing because you don't. You have nothing. Anything that is good in you, of you, or shown by you is because of God, not because of you. This is something the world doesn't understand. As you begin to under realize and understand that, the gifts, the interior gifts that are necessary for recollection, to understand the great desire of our love for our Lord, to increasingly live out your faith, and to recognize the great horror for sin we, sh we should all have, you will begin to grow in such a way that your love for our Lord will become more natural, the way it was meant to be. And that's really what we want. So you may be practicing it poorly, but that's all right. Keep going. But remember, just because you're practicing it poorly doesn't mean you can't do it better. And so like the first Saturday devotions, like uh, Divine Mercy, all, all the different types of devotions, like any novena, you've got to work at. Remember, that's what the lively faith is. Persevering and constancy and paying attention to what you're doing. These are the things. So again, Sacred Heart Devotion, Beautiful. First Fridays, we, we love them. Oh, it's First Friday, got to go to Mass. Okay. But are you doing these things? And do you realize that all those promises are associated to this? I know that you can do all of this because that's what God gives to us. But it's a, it's a matter of surrender. The willingness to surrender everything in order to receive everything that He gives us in His most precious adorable and sacred heart.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.